hello, wonderful human beings. I thought it was time for a little update. I realized recently when I was filming another video that it's been close to eight years that I've been sober now. And I used to have a video like this on my channel, but I watched it back and I think I made that video over four years ago and I felt like I just wanted to do an updated version. Sobriety is really a journey and I feel like I've also changed a lot as a person. So my thoughts on it have changed a little bit too. So today I'm just gonna walk you through my whole sobriety journey why I got sober, how I got sober, and give you a little bit of an eight year update. And before we get started, I wanted to say a huge thank you to Audible for sponsoring today's video. Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks, podcasts, and originals across every genre. You can find food related content, true crime, and so much more. As somebody who works from home and is constantly looking at a screen, whether that's my phone or a laptop, I'm a huge fan of Audible because it gives my eyes a break and it's perfect for my on the go lifestyle so I can multitask, get in some movement or go for a walk while I'm listening to something on Audible. A lot of my favorite books and books that kind of helped me throughout this journey are on Audible, so they're great to listen to. Atomic Habits, that's one of my personal favorites and a book that I come back to pretty often. But they also have incredible podcasts, lots of sobriety related podcast shows, as well as a lot of food podcasts, which I listen to while I'm cooking usually. If you click the link in the description box below, you can get a free trial of Audible. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from the entire catalog. Members get full access to the growing selection of audiobooks, Audible originals and podcasts, and you can download or stream the included titles all you want. You can use my code Remy Park for a free trial. I will leave that link down below. And now let's chat. I just want to put this disclaimer out there that this might be a sensitive topic for some of you. I'll be speaking to mental health a little bit as it relates to my sobriety story and the journey, so just keep that in mind. But this video is purely about my journey and in no way meant to shame anyone who is drinking. Um, it is a very real disease for a lot of people and for others, it's not an issue at all. So let's just keep that in mind as we go through the video and let's please keep it kind. So to give you a little bit of background context because my issues with substances and alcohol started very, very young. I was born in the US, lived in New York and New Jersey, and then when I was seven years old, my family moved to Asia for the first time. We've lived in many different countries in Asia, including Taiwan, China, and Thailand, and things were definitely very different over there, which has a bit of a part to play, I think, in my whole journey. And to add to that, I think it's important to mention that from a very young age, I was diagnosed with an eating disorder, as well as OCD, which is an anxiety disorder. And I would definitely describe myself as more of an anxious, introverted type of child. I think it's just worth mentioning because it really is all connected. And for me, it was quite a holistic journey. The journey to sobriety for me coincided with the journey towards eating disorder recovery and my eventual leap into veganism. And the last thing I'll say is that I have an amazing relationship with my family, my parents especially, and my two sisters. For a long time, I felt a lot of guilt for experiencing mental health issues or issues with substances and alcohol because I knew that I had a really great supportive family and upbringing and it almost felt like I had no reason to experience this kind of chaos in my life. I think it just goes to show you that it's not about your background or your upbringing. It can really happen to anybody. So for me, everything started at the age of seven or so. That was when I can first remember experiencing OCD symptoms and OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder. I know people like to joke a lot about it on the internet and make it all about being clean and tidy, but it is definitely something that impacts my life a lot. And even more so when I was younger, I wouldn't be able to sleep well because I would be constantly worried or fixated on somebody breaking into the house. I would map out the points of entry. I would worry about whether or not the door was locked and I would actually get out of bed after I had tucked myself in to make sure that the door was locked, even though I was the last person to lock the door. And I knew that. A lot of little things like that, but also personality wise, I definitely had a very addictive and obsessive personality. When I would get into a new hobby or anything really, I would either be at zero or a hundred. There was no in between for me. So let's say I got really into dancing. Dance was my entire life for a little bit. If I started reading a book I really liked, I would breeze through it and not be able to put it down. And I'm not sure whether that had any impact on my relationship later on with substances and alcohol, but if I had to guess, I would say it probably did. Around the same time, my family made our first move to Taiwan. That was our first move out of the country ever. And even though I'm part Taiwanese, it was a huge culture shock for me. I only ever knew life in the US. English was my first language. I didn't speak any Mandarin, neither did my parents. And I don't think my family had really been there much aside from that first move we made. When we got to Taiwan, I started to notice my body for the first time because in Asia, I felt like there were a lot of comments about bodies that were made and it was a cultural norm almost to just make a comment about someone's appearance and mothers would always say to my mom, oh my God, Remy's so big. And I think that maybe they meant I was tall because I was taller than most of the girls 
in Taiwan, but also, but also I did feel physically bigger too. And I became so aware of my body in a way that I never had been before. And then I discovered online forums where they've suggested eating ice cubes, cucumbers, these like negative calorie foods and learned all about calorie tracking and was on a mission to eat almost in a calorie deficit as much as possible. I became fixated on controlling my food, limiting my food intake, pre-planning all the meals that I would eat throughout the day and figuring out ways to eat less and less and less. And it worked, I definitely was shrinking. And when I think back on it, now that I'm a little bit older, I think that it could have also been my way of trying to gain some feeling of agency or control because I felt like my life was a little bit out of my hands at that point. We had never moved before in my life and I had to completely start over at seven years old. Growing up in Taiwan wasn't bad. I loved the people in Taiwan, they were so kind and I got really lucky with some amazing friends. But throughout my time there from age roughly seven to 12. I remember definitely being depressed. I was self-harming. I, I almost had a little bit of like an emo phase, if you will. And I know a lot of people have, but I think I mean it literally too, because I was self-harming and really just unhappy with myself. And then my family made our move to Shanghai after that. And that's when things started to change a little bit. Very quickly after my first year there, I went out to a club and realized that in Shanghai, that was fairly normal. Actually in a lot of Asian countries and especially to do with international schools, it was considered fairly normal. And while there is a drinking age, I think sometimes living there as a foreigner or an expatriate, which my family was, um, you have access sometimes to things that you really shouldn't, even at age 13. So finding alcohol was really easy and affordable. You could grab a gigantic beer and just check out at like a 7-Eleven or a Family Mart or a Lawson's, which is what we had there. And they wouldn't even check your ID or ask you any questions. So one of my very first nights out at a club, which was a place that we would frequent a lot, even at 13, um, I had so much to drink. I didn't know what my limit was at all. And right after that, I also tried ketamine unknowingly because I didn't know what it was. I was just told that it would make me feel a little bit better. And shortly after those two events, something really, really terrible happened to me that was very traumatic. And I don't know that I really processed it very much at the time, but that was kind of what led to my spiral into partying. I experienced so much on my first night out that I no longer felt like Things that I had feared before were a big deal at all. Everything escalated pretty quickly. And like I said, my personality type is to really embrace things that I'm getting into for the first time. So I became all about partying and all about being inebriated in any way that I could be. I also stopped taking substances so seriously because I think having taken my very first one and it being a pretty hard substance, I started to think of some other more conventional things like cigarettes and maybe marijuana as being not a big deal. And I would create these levels for myself. For example, I would tell myself, well, it's not that bad because I would never snort something. And then I would, and then I would create a next level. Oh, well, I would never smoke something, but I did. And then I would say, okay, well, I would never ever inject anything. And it would just go on and on and on. And eventually I basically surpassed all these like fake limitations that I'd created for myself when I realized things had gotten pretty bad. And the drinking became less of a social thing and more of an isolated thing that I would do to cope. And I think I just wanted to dissociate because I was depressed. I was also on antidepressants at the time and was diagnosed with depression. By the time I was in maybe sophomore, junior, senior year, kind of later into high school, things really escalated quickly and it kind of changed from being a social activity and something where I just look forward to going out, which I really did love. Like I loved the music. I loved the whole event of it all. And it became a lot more about a coping mechanism, I think, where I would drink alone even sometimes. I just didn't really want to feel anything. I think I wanted to dissociate and it was my way of coping with things I didn't know how to talk about because I didn't feel like I could talk to anybody about some of the things that I'd experienced. At the time I was definitely going through something as it was, trying to process one of the very bad things that happened to me when Another really bad thing happened to me, probably even more traumatizing in a different way because it involved more people. And, and that was really when I hit my rock bottom, I think, where I started to wonder if I would even go to college anymore. And I didn't really care, to be honest. Like one thing about me is that throughout all of that, I always made sure my grades were solid and I did everything I needed to do. My parents had no idea. I would always be great at home and try to be high achieving because it was also a facade that I liked to keep up and almost trick myself into thinking that I didn't have a problem. Like if I could keep up my good grades, get into a good college and all of that, then obviously I was functioning. There was nothing wrong, right? I would even go so far as to make sure that I showed up to church on Sunday mornings when my parents would go. And sometimes it was pretty mortifying because there were a lot of teachers from my school that went to that church. My hair would be still smelling like smoke. Sometimes I'd have on makeup from the night before, or I'd still be a little bit buzzed or high or something. And I kind of just had to sit there 
It almost made me feel worse, like I was being very judged. So that definitely weakened my relationship with religion. Because I also thought to myself, it just didn't make sense that, that if there was a God, that they would do something like that to me. It just kind of felt like it was one thing after another that was piling on top of me and there was no way for me to get out of it. Towards the end of high school, I was diagnosed with depression because I stopped showing up to school. I didn't care to be there anymore and it was actually a pretty toxic environment for me to be in because some of the really negative things that I experienced um, happened with people that were involved with my school. So I tried to stay home as much as I could. I slept the most I'd ever slept in my life, which I think was a huge sign of depression. I don't think I've ever slept that much in my life, ever. It was crazy and I was put on antidepressants. Alcohol is a depressant and that's something that I definitely noticed did not help with, <laughs> with me trying to get out of a depression, not to mention things like MDMA. There are a lot of substances that interfere a lot with your brain and especially when you are taking another medication or you're trying to get out of a certain place with something that's related to your mental health, they can be so detrimental. Anyway, by some miracle, I got into college and I just knew I had to make it to graduation and that I would have a fresh start. I went to school back in New York. I went to Barnard, which is part of Columbia University. And just being in a completely fresh environment and outside of Asia, I think helped me so much because number one, substances and alcohol were not nearly as accessible as they were in Asia. And you actually needed a fake ID, which I had never had before in my life. And two, I was around people who did not come from an international school background. Of course, there were some at my school, but my roommate, for example, was not an international student. A lot of my closest friends that I made in college were not international students. And just by sharing stories about my high school experience, I realized that a lot of what I experienced was very abnormal. I had a really hard time connecting with friends there in the beginning because all I wanted to do was go out and I did make a few friends that strictly wanted to go out clubbing and that's what made me feel the most at home. Um, the access to substances was definitely much harder. Alcohol, not so much, but friends had fake IDs and things like that. It was really interesting, I guess, to see the contrast between people who were in college and wanting to experience a lot of the things for the first time that I was kind of over with and t sort of towards my end with. I didn't feel like I could keep up with my behaviors much longer because I'd been doing it for so long and so regularly. Meanwhile, my peers were all having their first drinks or some of their first party experiences or going to a club in Manhattan for the first time. I think that was part of the reason why I didn't really enjoy college. I loved what I was studying. I was studying psychology, but I just, didn't really enjoy being on campus and I felt really anxious, like I didn't have a family support there, but it kind of felt like I had this opportunity to finally get my life together and it felt like a new fresh start that I needed to take advantage of. So I took my life very seriously. I was not a fun person in college. Um, I don't know if anybody has been following me since college, but back then I was so focused on graduating early because I wanted to save money and I also wanted to work school jobs while I was in school and in between during like the summers um, to have internships. I was so goal focused at that time and I decided also at that time that I wanted to start seeing someone on campus. Um, I was really lucky my college provided these free sessions every quarter, a limited number to speak with the on-campus therapist and I took full advantage of that. I went in to see her and of course I just went in thinking, I just wanna find out ways where I could be more productive with my OCD um, in class. And as you do when you're in therapy, you kind of open up and you share your background story and so we kinda of had to get into everything else. I ended up working primarily on my eating disorder first, but as a result, I started also working on my sobriety. So I worked with the on-campus nutritionist and I started my Instagram account because I didn't wanna do an inpatient treatment off campus. I felt like I had just started this new life and I didn't wanna be behind. I didn't want my issues with mental health to kind of hold me back from achieving in life because it almost felt like finally I'd made it through the clouds and I actually had this motivation to do something with myself and care again about life. And so, if you guys know my origin story, I created my Instagram account, I started sharing my meals there, I kept a meal log so that I wouldn't have to be somewhere inpatient or check in more often with somebody while I was working through my eating disorder. And as a result, I also found it really hard to keep up with the substance and alcohol abuse because as I was getting healthier, it almost felt like I could feel things more in my body than ever before. And I had also gone vegan around the same time. And I don't know if this is real science or not, but the healthier I got, it felt like I could feel the effects a lot more of what these substances and the alcohol was doing to my body. And that made it so impossible to maintain. I started to go to AA meetings um, in the evenings sometimes, on the weekends sometimes. There were a couple of different churches that hosted the meetings around the area that I went to college in, so it was pretty accessible for me. Um, I didn't always enjoy it just because I found that the 12-step program wasn't necessarily 
perfect for me. Like one thing that I didn't really connect with was the kind of religious affiliation with the 12 step program. It's an incredible program and helps a lot of people. But like I mentioned earlier, I had this kind of strange relationship with religion after everything that had happened. And I just didn't really feel like I had anything to thank God or anyone else for because I'd gone through it myself and here I was like digging myself out of the hole that I created and maybe it was a very selfish mindset but that was one thing that just didn't resonate with me so I went very sporadically but also I was surprised to find that quitting was a lot easier than I had expected it to be because like I said once I stopped drinking as much and I got healthier it was really really hard my tolerance definitely went down it's not to say that I didn't have slip ups because I definitely did along the way but every time I would slip up I would notice a huge difference because I would actually take a break from substances and I would feel that <laughs> and it was really hard to get over how physically bad it felt so I graduated early I got sober and it's funny because I got sober before I was legally able to drink um, but I got sober I graduated and I became really interested in wellness through my blog through everything that was going on through veganism and learning about nutrition but I think really what it is is that I became interested in well-being and wellness because I was really unwell it's almost like I didn't have a choice like I needed to be interested in my well-being otherwise I was headed the other way. Recently I read this book and in it, it kind of mentioned this like addict to fitness junkie or wellness junkie pipeline, which is something I'd love to talk about in another video because I think I definitely did experience that trajectory. Obviously you guys know what I'm into these days and what my channel is all about. That's a topic for another video. So as I'm sure you guys know, a big part of my journey has been being able to share everything online. Um, I shared a lot and I wrote actually a series on my blog called the sobriety series, which I eventually ended up taking down because I wanted to kind of look at it with a fresh set of eyes and update it a little bit more. I wrote that, gosh, maybe like four or five years ago now. And so I definitely want to rewrite that at some point, but I needed to kind of give myself a break from that. So if you see it missing, um, that's why. As a result of that, I was also forced to open up to my parents about everything that had gone down. Keep in mind at this point, they really didn't know anything that had happened. Maybe they had suspected an eating disorder because that was something that was visually obvious, but everything else I kept very hidden from them because again, it was a lot of guilt and shame and this idea in my head that if I was a good daughter, good student, did everything I was supposed to do as like an Asian daughter that I didn't actually have a problem. And I was very obsessed with keeping up that facade. Um, I remember one day calling my mom in my last year of college so it makes me cry when I think about it because it was a really hard phone call. I called her and I told her just everything that had happened starting from the very beginning. And I felt like I, I felt like I was breaking her heart and I didn't want her to feel like something that they had done parenting wise led to this. And I remember I kept telling her like, I was so happy as a kid. You guys were great parents to me. I just don't know what happened. Like, yeah, that was a tough phone call, but it also opened up the door for me to be really raw and transparent with my family members. And that was like a whole next step for me um, on the healing path. And it was very painful, <laughs> but also very healing. After graduating early, I got my first corporate job. I was working at a consulting firm and the hours were not what I expected because I was in this program that wasn't actually what my full-time role was gonna be, but sort of like an intro training program. And I slowly started to realize that I was slipping back into these old habits. There are certain substances that are widely used in the consulting and like finance world that are kind of normal, especially in the New York scene. Um, and I was around that a lot more than I expected to be. And also not sleeping enough, not eating enough, just like my bases were not covered. And when that happens and you have any kind of disease, whether it's addiction or like a physical disease of some kind, um, you start to fall apart a little bit. It really takes a lot to maintain mental well-being sometimes. And for me, the most important is to make sure that like my foundation is always set, that I'm eating right, sleeping enough, taking care of myself. And I absolutely wasn't. So I started to notice myself slipping again, feeling like, you know, maybe I will kind of go out. Maybe I will try a little bit of this substance that everyone is using to stay productive and stay alert. And I ended up leaving my job because I realized that I would not be able to stay sober and maintain my sobriety if I continued with that job and that career path. And it was really tough, but I was really proud of myself in that moment for choosing my well-being. But also I knew that if I didn't choose that for myself, I probably wouldn't be able to even do the job period. So knowing that I was falling apart inside, I wouldn't even be effective at the job anyway. So I was like, let's just, Let's just cut it off right here. I've got to leave this job. I took a leave for a little bit. I started doing more intensive therapy and I ended up not being able to go back to that job, which 
turned out to work out okay because here we are now. It is probably the only reason that I ever decided to pursue this path of full-time content creation. I never saw it as something that I would want to risk doing full-time because I'm, I'm a very safe person. Despite everything that I've told you with the substances and alcohol, I like to feel like my bases are covered. I just like to feel safe, period. And it was not the safe option, but when it became my only option, it forced me to make it happen. And now I've been doing content for close to, I don't know, nine, 10 years maybe, and we're still here. And so I am really actually grateful that I experienced that with my corporate job because had that not happened, I don't know that I would be creating videos for you now. So I'm about eight years now into this sobriety journey and I can tell you I've experienced plenty of things that were really, really difficult. Um, I lost a lot of friends, relationships with people, lost a lot of connection with people for many years. I felt like I just had a hard time connecting with people. But most importantly, I really lost myself. I didn't really know who I was without this fun, fake personality of being extremely extroverted and wanting to talk to anybody and hugging strangers when I was not in my right mind and still on the substances and alcohol. And I also became terrified of most dinners, social events, um, parties, raves, concerts, festivals, like all these things that I used to enjoy, I felt like I could no longer take part because I realized that alcohol and substances to a certain degree are very normal. It's actually abnormal to not partake in those things in our society and it's just funny how when you go out to eat with your family and they're putting wine glasses down, when you let the server know like I'm not drinking, it's almost like this weird thing to say where everyone at the table is like, why are you expecting? Are you taking medication? Are you driving? Um, I'm none of those things right now. And so it's just something that I've always noticed where like people really find it odd when you aren't partaking. Now, after eight years, I've become really comfortable depending on the situation, just straight up saying like, no, I'm not drinking. I have been eight years sober. Um, sometimes it's almost an easier way to respond to kind of like shock the person inquiring, but other times, I'll just make an excuse or I'll just say, no, nope, I don't drink, no explanation needed. I don't feel like I need to explain my life to anybody. You don't owe anyone an explanation of the things you choose or choose not to do. And I think I've realized that it is possible to maintain your sobriety and still do the things that you used to do and things that you love. In fact, I actually think it's even more enjoyable sober. I feel like my authentic self. I can actually remember the things that I've done. And physically, I feel the best that I've ever felt in my life. Not drinking, it does force you to go against the grain a little bit, but that's also one of the most invaluable lessons that I've been forced to learn. And as a result, I feel so much more confident in who I am as a person. And I never have to question whether the way that I feel is how I really feel or something that I'm feeling synthetically because of some kind of substance or alcohol. It is still possible to have fun even if you are sober. You don't need substances or alcohol to have fun. And in fact, if you can't have fun without them, maybe you're not actually having fun at all. If you need something to manufacture a good time, is it even really a good time? So my current phase of healing now is getting over a lot of the guilt that I feel. I think another part of the AA program is that they do focus a lot on making amends and apologizing. And I have done that, of course, but I still think that there are certain people that I'll never reach that I've probably affected in a negative way, even without realizing or intending to. And I talked about this in a recent video that I posted, but it's just something that I realize I need to get over because People can change, people can heal, and people can grow, and we need to give ourselves grace as well. But I think that sometimes I become obsessed with this idea that I need to do amazing things for people all the time, like philanthropy work and giving back and donations because I felt like I was such a terrible person in the past. Of course, it's a genuine desire for me to help people and do something good for people versus just be a selfish, addict and you know going through whatever I was going but there is also a limit there's a point at which it becomes a little bit unhealthy and I'm like stressing myself out with these things but I think I really do focus a lot on whether or not I'm being a quote good person and it affects even the way that I interact with other people now to the point where I'll overstep my own boundaries because I don't want to mistreat someone else, even though it's at the cost of my own peace and maybe what I should really be doing. But to that point, I really thank veganism for teaching me to be compassionate towards myself. Although I wouldn't say veganism is the thing that helped me get sober, it was definitely a huge factor in that journey because I was learning so much about doing better for others, including the animals, the environment, and doing better for yourself health-wise. And yet at the same time, I didn't have the compassion for myself quite yet. It took me some time to get there, I think. 
And part of that was just like forgiving myself almost and realizing that the compassionate lifestyle has to also apply to the way you treat yourself. So now I feel very grateful that I have some kind of platform where I get to share stuff like this. I know it's not my primary content focus for a lot of people that come to my channel for the food and stuff, but it's really incredible and life altering. I think when you receive a message from someone letting you know that you've helped them in some small, small way. And for me, when I see people connecting with my stories about sobriety and the journey that I've been on through this healing process, um, it's, it makes it worth it because even if I get one message or this video reaches one person, um, that to me is very much worth sharing even the darkest parts of my story. And I think it also serves as a reminder that even the lives that seem the most glamorous, I know sometimes with social media, it can seem like my life is 100% aesthetic and glamorous and just easy and fun. And it is a lot of those things some of the time. There's a lot of darkness that got me here, if that makes sense. And there are still days where I feel like I take a step back because healing is just like this non-linear path and it's an ebb and flow. Something I can say that's been really incredible to witness is also the way that now this sober curiosity has become kind of trendy, mocktails are popular, and I love it. I don't think that you need to come from a place of being an addict or having a history with alcohol or substances to want to drink less or try out sobriety. I don't think that at all because when you really break it down, I don't think alcohol is that great for anybody. I love that it's part of the conversation now because it does help to fight a lot of the stigma around it being strange to not drink. Um, it means that restaurants are offering more mocktail options so I don't just have to get like a soda at a restaurant. It means that a lot more of my friends are open to mocktail nights or having a sober night with me while everyone else is drinking. And it's just been really incredible to witness, but most importantly, I love it because I think that through sobriety, I've been able to connect with who I really am. Alcohol and substances are almost like a mask. I know that it's super common to have this almost alter ego when you're drinking, to feel more fun and vibrant and confident and sexy or whatever it is when you're drinking. And it's cool to be able to feel that way without the need for any additional substances. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It's been a crazy journey and every year I almost forget that it's something to celebrate because it's become so normal to me after this long. But if you are somebody that is currently struggling, I will leave some resources down below. I could not recommend more creating a community or having an accountability buddy or someone to speak to to help you through the journey because it is not easy. If you made it this far in the video, I'm sending you lots of love. Thank you so much for listening to my story and holding space for it. And if you have any additional questions or things that you'd like to see in another video or another video like this, maybe on that addict to wellness pipeline topic, I would love to make more videos like this. Thank you again for watching. Thank you for being here and I'm sending you lots of love. Bye.